So, here's a cell. Okay, here's a cell. If this is a cell from an organism such as yourself, some nice, and we're going to talk about this more tomorrow, eukaryotic organism, you have a bunch of stuff in that cell. Did you, at some point in 7th or 8th grade, talk about what's inside of cells? Yeah. Okay. So, name me one thing that's in there. Okay, mitochondria, a nucleus, what else did I hear? S cell membrane, what? Yeah, nucleus, um, what else? <clears throat> nuclei is just the plural of nucleus. So one cell has a nucleus, ten cells have nuclei. Uh, huh? Oh, vacuoles in, in plant cells, yes. Okay, so let's put in the nucleus. And somebody mentioned cell wall, only in plant cells. So all cells have a membrane, which is just what separates inside from outside, um, but only plant cells have a wall. Okay, so what, what's in the nucleus? What's in the nucleus? Piles and piles and piles of what? DNA wrapped around proteins to form what? Chromosomes. So we've got all these little chromosomes in here that have, I'll enlarge this for a second. They look like candy canes. That have all this DNA sort of wrapped around them. Okay, so we have DNA. Now, the nucleus sort of contains the DNA. It keeps it um, in one place. And the DNA can't ever leave the nucleus. That's really important to understand. So the DNA can't leave the nucleus, but what did we say the DNA provides instructions for? Making protein. protein. So. Unless we're going to make the protein inside the nucleus, we have a problem here. And we're not going to make the protein inside the nucleus. Do you remember the term ribosomes? Is that familiar from doing cell stuff before? Okay. Anybody remember what a ribosome is? Okay. No. But you have some good connections there. So. Yeah, ribosomes are actually the thing, it's the little organelle that makes the protein. It's where the protein gets made. Actually, I guess it's more the site where the protein gets made than the thing that does it. So there are ribosomes, and I'm going to make them something really nice and bright. We'll make them this sort of orangey color. There are ribosomes scattered all around the cell, but they're out in the cytoplasm. Okay. And those ribosomes, well, just that's enough representative ribosomes. Those ribosomes are where protein gets made. So, ribosome, where protein is made. Did I spell protein wrong again? Have I mentioned that I can't reliably spell protein and I'm rather embarrassed about that because I have a bachelor's degree in biology? Yes. Still can't spell protein. There we go. That's better. Okay. So the proteins are made in the ribosome. Somehow we have to get the instructions for making the protein from the DNA out of the nucleus to the ribosomes. But the DNA is really long, it's really awkward, it's wrapped around all those proteins, um, can't leave the nucleus. So somehow we have to have some sort of messenger system, tight, that will allow us to get the instructions for making protein out to the ribosomes. So one thing to know about the nucleus is that if we sort of do, we'll call this our expanded view of the nucleus. 
Okay, so if we look at an expanded view of the nucleus, it's actually got holes in it. Okay, so it's got these holes in it. They're called nuclear pores. And those nuclear pores aren't big enough to let the DNA come out, but we can get something in and out of them. If only we could make, because remember, the DNA is that big, wide, sort of double ladder. So if only we could, like, split it in half and only take half of it out, that would fit out the nuclear pore. Well, in fact, that's kind of what happens. Okay, so do you remember what DNA stood for? DNA was... So DNA was deoxyribonucleic acid, and it's a double-stranded molecule, so it's the two sides of the ladder, and then we twist it, and it's got you know, a base on each side. Well, what happens to get the instructions from the DNA out to where the proteins are made is we make a copy of half of it at a time. Okay. So the copy of half of it is called RNA, and it's ribonucleic acid. The, so there are two big differences. Um, one is that, I mean, obviously, immediately, it's only half of the size of the DNA which means it can come out of those nuclear pores because it's smaller. It's literally like we split the ladder in half to get it out the door. Now, if you were actually trying to carry a ladder someplace to get someplace, that wouldn't work. But in this case, it works just fine. And it's called ribonucleic because the sugars on the sides are different. You don't need to know that. So inside the <coughs> um, nucleus, RNA copies are made and they go out to the, ribosome, or to the ribosomes. So what happens is that inside the nucleus, a section of DNA actually unzips. And this is usually, it's right in the middle of a section of DNA. Um, I mean, it could be on an end, but, you know, just a portion. Because remember, that, that entire strand of DNA on a chromosome um, might be, I don't know, 10 yards long. It's, it might be 30 feet long. Just a little portion of it opens up, unzips, and a copy is made of RNA. Now, once that happens, I'm going to try to draw a nuclear pore here. That RNA can come out into the cytoplasm and then it can travel to a ribosome. I'm giving you very much the, the 10 cent overview here. And it actually feeds itself through the ribosome like cash register tape. Um, what's something else that you've had to feed through something? So cash register tape is one example. Most of you probably haven't done a lot of that. Um, a roll of stickers into a sticker gun. What else would you have fed through something? Printer paper. Um, so it actually feeds right through the ribosome, and the ribosome sort of opens up um, into two halves, like a little Pac-Man. And the um, RNA goes right straight into it. Goes right straight into it. <clears throat> then, at the ribosome, and I need one more color here. I'll go with uh, I'll go with this sort of. That's not all that much different. I'll go with a purpley. The ribosome actually makes another copy of the RNA. And then these little tiny messengers come along, and they are carrying amino acids. And each one of these little messengers matches, whoops, strike that. Each one of these little messengers actually matches 
little three base portions of the RNA. And they go along, every three bases they read it, they pop an amino acid into place, it's like little Lego blocks, and when they're done, those amino acids are a protein, and the RNA just gets dissolved again. Okay. So there are a couple things to know about copying RNA from DNA. Okay, so you remember that we had these base pairing rules in DNA. A always pairs with T, adenine, thionine. C always pairs with G, cytosine and guanine. It sounds like bat poop, but it's not. Well, that's great. When we make RNA, there's one little difference. So I'm going to unzip this half and bring it over here. And this would still, by the way, be connected up above the point that we're looking at. So literally just a section of it unzips. It's as if a zipper broke and suddenly you could unzip your sleeping bag zipper right in the middle. When that unzips, the RNA comes in and matches up bases, and C and G are still a pair. And every place there's a T, you get an A. That matches. I'm going to put these in first and kind of save the punchline for last. But any place on the RNA where you would normally have a T, so in other words, right here, because there is no thiamine in RNA, you get a U. And U stands for uracil. Sounds like urine, but it's not. And so the RNA, that's the other big difference. It's only half the width of the DNA. I mean, I, I can't say it's half a molecule because it's an entire molecule. But every place that you would normally expect you would find a T, you now find a U. And that's what goes out to the ribosome. That's what um, makes proteins. Now, I, I have a serious problem here. Um, I screwed that up, but that's okay. When it goes out to the ribosomes, it reads them in three-letter words. And we call those three-letter words codons. And obviously, you see why I screwed up, because I've got one spare little letter down there. So we would have to imagine that that extends beyond there, and there are three letters. So a codon is always three letters. Are you noticing that this is a lot of copying? It's a ton of copying. Copy this, then copy that, replicate the DNA, then copy the, RM, the RNA, then copy this again. There's a huge potential to screw up at any point. What do we call a screw up in copying genetic code? Mutation. A mutation. We call it a mutation. Now, here's the thing. What if we accidentally delete a letter? It's called, okay, this is really creative and hard to remember, a deletion mutation. What if we accidentally insert a letter where there was none? Guess what that's called? An insertion mutation. Um, and we can also just copy the wrong letter. I can't remember what right off my head what that's called. Um, we can just have, you know, instead of an A, you get a C. You can have that happen, too. Sometimes the effect of a mutation is good. Remember all my little blue-eyed mutants? 10,000 years ago, the first human baby with blue eyes, that was a mistake. The protein that coded for the, for the um, or rather, the DNA that coded for the proteins that make your eye look the way it does... There was a mistake in copying. And suddenly there was this blue-eyed baby human. It's a mistake. Did it turn out to be a good mistake? It actually had um, blue eyes actually have a survival advantage at northern latitudes. Um, what part of the globe do you find more blue-eyed people coming from? Near the equator or near the poles? Well, near the poles. Yeah. Um, 
why, well, yeah, especially the mutation happened in northern Europe. Um, at those northern latitudes, you need to allow all the sunlight in you can on skin and hair to make enough vitamin D, and less of your skin is exposed to sunlight at northern latitudes because more of it's covered up because it's cold. So light skin, light hair, light eyes have a survival advantage there. Light skin, light hair, and light eyes are a terrible idea if you're living at the equator. You don't have the protection of melanin from all sorts of damage to your skin. Okay, so mutations can be good. A mutation can also be bad. Um, there are mutations that are so bad they're automatically fatal. There are mutations that mean a cell does not go on. There are mutations <coughs> such as cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a disease of the lungs. It's actually a disease of the whole body. And it's, it's a mutation that has gotten passed on from one individual to another. It's a recessive condition. But, um, you know, it's, it's a horrible disease. It's painful and it shortens lifespans. And, you know, I mean, now people survive much longer. There are people in their 60s and 70s with, with CF. Um, at one time, life expectancy for a CF patient was about three years old. And that was, like, in the 1940s and 50s. There was literally nothing you could do. Um, and even in the 70s, life expectancies were 20 years, 30 years. So it's really changed, but it's still, it's a, it's a tough disease. Mutations can be bad. But here's the surprising news. So you, may, you, you knew that mutations could be good or bad, right? Did you know that mutations can be completely unnoticeable? You can have a mutation that changes nothing. You can have a mutation that changes absolutely nothing. Because a lot of times these little codons actually code for the same protein. So you can have multiple codons that make the same protein. <clears throat> if, the, if the spelling change in the codon doesn't change the protein, there's no effect from the mutation. Okay. That was a whole lot to toss out at once. What we're going to do now is watch a five-minute video and see if Teacher's Pet can sum this up better than I can. We will stop it as we go and do summaries at the one minute, so do not put away your notes because you're going to add these to your notes. Okay, so having watched Teacher's Pet, um, what we're going to do is start off with some codon practice and... Um, the columns got shifted here. That's okay. Um, so we're going to walk through this together. I'm just going to go ahead and work through this. Um, on this sheet, the first thing I want you to do is this line right here, I want you to m sort of scribble that out, and you're going to put a line in, because the line got shifted, there. Okay. Because what you're seeing, so we should have, whoops, every three, every three bases, you code for an amino acid. Okay? So, they've given you the mRNA. The challenge is this. Thinking backwards to what the DNA would have been before that. So, what was the base in DNA that would have gotten you a matching A in the RNA? Uh, T. T. So this would be a T. What would have been the base in DNA that would have gotten you a U in the RNA? A. That's an A. Okay. Here's what you're going to do. Um... Finish this first column, and so here's your homework. Finish the first column and this column. Let's do a couple together. 
If you have an A in mRNA, what are you going to have in the tRNA? A U. If you have a U in the mRNA, what are you going to have in the tRNA? A. If you have a G, what are you going to have? C. Okay. These two columns are homework. They are due when you walk in tomorrow. Have a wonderful day, folks.